Okay, so we're, I, I'm going to try to keep this a, a broad talk. Uh, usually I give a lot of kind of heavy science stuff and have a lot of data slides. So I only got one data slide and it's right towards the very back. So I did that on purpose. So if there's questions, jump in, feel free to, to, to fire away. I think that was some, some good background that Amber covered. I think I'm going to be able to build on that a little bit and hopefully uh, add some value to what we were talking about there. Oops. Okay. So I want to just start out making sure that we all are thinking about the same thing when we talk about rangelands. Like most people think a home on the range, you know, where the bison are wandering around. The reality is if you look globally at what the definition of rangelands are, there are any terrestrial lands that provide forage and habitat for free-ranging herbivores. So that means it could be a camel, it could be a, a, a water buffalo, or it could be an elephant, or it could be a bison, a deer, or a cow, or a sheep, or a yak, or whatever the case is. So it includes both domestic and it also includes wildlife species. And if you think about Alberta, that's pretty much everywhere. Pretty much all of Alberta is rangeland if you ex exclude urban industrial, water, and cropland per se. Okay, so you think of all the boreal forest, for example. And the other thing is, especially on public land, rangelands often provide multiple uses. So it means we're not only concerned with the provision of forage and habitat, we are also interested in things like water storage, water purification, wildlife and biodiversity, the biodiversity that Amber was talking about, uh, fiber production and so on. So and that mandate is especially important on public land because it's not a, just about forage production, it's about meeting all kinds of other land uses. On private land, it's a little bit different because you have a single landowner or a company that's responsible for making decisions on that land base. But it doesn't matter whether you're talking about antelope, mule deer, or beef cattle, and beef cattle happen to be the single largest agricultural commodity in Alberta. So interestingly enough, you know, after lunch, when you were going around to your different stations, I was kind of shocked that the beef industry was not here, the Alberta beef producers. I do a lot of work with them, and they're the single largest commodity in this province. Okay, so if you look globally, this is one of the reasons why I really got fired up when I was an undergrad at university and I started really getting into this field of, of rangeland, rangeland ecology, rangeland management, when I realized that the majority of the planet actually falls into this category of rangelands. So most people think of open grasslands, fine, uh, but it includes steppe lands, so shrub dominated, which are huge parts of Africa, Australia, even uh, the, the parts of Siberia, and also he, even here in Western Canada. It also includes barrens. So when you think of the high Arctic tundra, what's grazing up there? Musk ox, reindeer, they all constitute rangelands. And boreal forest. What do we have in the boreal forest? We got moose, we've got woodland caribou, we've got elk. We also have cattle grazing. A lot of my colleagues are stunned when they find out how much cattle grazing actually goes on in the boreal forest. There's an enormous amount in Alberta. It's a very valuable resource. So collectively, about 70% of the planet's terrestrial lands actually fall into this category of rangeland. So it's a big chunk of territory. The other thing, diversity. And Amber, you already did a great job talking about diversity. The fact that none of these rangelands are the same makes it a really interesting field to work in. Because we've got everything from the Aspen Parkland area, which is that area up around Edmonton and, and where we are here now, although a lot of it is cropland, through to the foothills of southwestern Alberta and the Rockies, to the boreal forest, and then to the mixed grass prairie. Enormous diversity. Differences in vegetation, in climate, in soils. This is a basic soil map. We have everything from the very dry, low organic, brown chernozemic soils to the very fertile, rich, black chernozemic soils that are here in the Olds area that are now largely cropped. But think pre-European settlement. All of this land that we were on here was once grassland with a few pockets of shrublands and trees grazed by millions of bison, elk, antelope, and deer. It's only now that we've completely changed this landscape. Where we are here today was once rangeland. Okay, what is rangeland management? I'm going through this deliberately because it's one thing to define rangelands, but rangeland management brings in the anthropogenic component, us. The fact that people care about what's going on in these areas. So this is the deliberate management using different tools and strategies of the landscapes, the plants, the plant communities, 
for the sustainable and perpetual production of different goods and services. Forage is the historical one that rangeland management evolved over, which was about 80 to 100 years ago, but it's completely changed today. And I'll explain shortly what I mean by that. The discipline of rangeland management is incredibly interdisciplinary. It draws on soil science, the, the you know, soil health, and I do agree with soil health. The only thing I have a concern about is that we need to define it operationally. It's one of these big, complex cluster concepts that if you don't define it, then how is it a useful term operationally for a scientist or for a farmer or anyone that's trying to improve the soil? So th that's my only concern. Absolutely, though, soil health is important. Soil, animal, plant, landscape ecology, meteorology, fire science, these things are all interrelated. Many of my students, though, are stunned to find out when they leave university, most of their program is about biology and ecology, 80%. But when they get into the real world, because we have so many people on this planet, most of your management job becomes, well, people management. It's actually more social. Because so many people care about these lands and these resources, especially public land. They're stunned to find out that they should have learned a lot more about the sociology, about how to work with people and how to compromise and mitigate conflict and so on. The other thing I want to point out is the philosophy of grain, uh, rangeland management and even agricultural management. You can expand this example to include any agricultural lands. This is really, really important. If there's nothing else that you take home from my spiel today, this is maybe the most important piece. Because every producer, every rancher, every farmer varies in their management philosophy. They're either intensive, moderately intensive, or extensive, and I want to define what I mean by that. And this applies to grazers as well. So, for example, a moderate grazing intensity framework or management system might involve tame pasture with some fertilization where you're seeding forages or overseeding into it every three or four years. But on the other hand, we have over three million acres of native grassland that has never been cultivated in this province. These are very biodiverse uh, areas where these grasslands predate settlement. These, are, these were the original grasslands that were being grazed by elk and bison and so on, far before European settlement. And you can have a very different management philosophy by design. So I want to contrast these two paradigms. And this is not to throw the canola industry under the bus, by the way. I'm not trying to do that because we grow canola at home ourselves. The pr mass production of food, whether it's wheat, barley, canola, flax, pulses, whatever, has a very important role in our society. But you have to understand that there's a management implication by choosing to either manage an area cropland, like canola, or managing an area like this using an extensive philosophy. The difference is, in the agronomic situation, the cropland, we are applying lots of inputs. Fertilizer, water, herbicides, pesticides, okay, fuel. All of those things are being intended to maximize the yields, to get as much out of, we can, out of the land as we can, every acre, every hectare, to get as much as we can. It's highly intrusive of the ecosystem, and it actually works against the ecosystem. And I'm going to define that shortly in more detail, because I think it's really important. In contrast, you can decide to work with this landscape and to minimize the ecological impacts by maintaining what's there. So I want to dig into this in more detail. So this is not a data graph, this is just an example. So every agricultural, <laughs> and he's, they're going, ah, oh, he lied, he's showing more data. This is just an example I threw together. Every agricultural system is what we call stochastic, it's noisy. Because no two growing seasons is the same. You get a dry year, a wet year, you get too much more, you get just right, right, like the, like the three bears. Um, changes in production are highly variable. So let's say this is variable production over time. This is a 25 year period. We know, if, if, if we see peak yields up here, we know we can hit this point. So someone who's striving to get the most out of their system says, 
I can hit that red line every year. I should be able to. I did it in year three, year four, which means I should be able to do it every single year. Okay? But it also means you have to recognize what's holding me back, what's keeping me from hitting that. So it could be in year six, lack of nutrients. What would you do if you were trying to maximize production? Fertilize. <coughs> Maybe this was a weed infestation during this period. What would you do? You would spray it with a herbicide. Lack of water, what would you do? You would irrigate, okay? So if it's a pest outbreak, maybe an insect outbreak, you put on an insecticide. But all of these, so you know you can hit those yields. So you might make the decision, I'm going to try to hit that maximum every year. This is what you might do. Fertilize, spray a pesticide, cultivate or till. But you already heard from Amber that there are problems with tillage. Okay, and you're going to hear it here again. Lack of water, you might irrigate. Okay, so now I'm going to challenge you. What are the ecological costs that are going to come about from fertilizing? You fertilize every year. You keep going trying to hit that maximum. What could happen? Runoff. runoff. You could get runoff of nutrients and eutrophication of water bodies, algal blooms, massive fish die-offs. Okay, what else? Yeah, you can change the chemistry of the soil, which actually compromises productivity. What else? Expensive. It's expensive too. That affects the bottom line, and that's a whole nother issue because you're always chasing your debt. You're always trying to pay off this big operating loan that you've got. Yeah, go ahead. Change the soil oh, you will change the soil microbiology, and you can get groundwater contamination. In areas of sandy soil, you get too much nitrogen going down, you can affect the aquifers. You, you can see where I'm going with this, right? What about the cultivation tillage? Well, you already answered that earlier, right? It was erosion. What else? There was one that wasn't brought up. You said three major negatives, but there's one more that is massive. Think of climate change. Carbon. Cropland soils on average are 30 to 50% lower in carbon stock. So when we think of elevated CO2 in the atmosphere that you hear about all the time, it's not just the burning of fossil fuels. It's land use conversion. The fact that we've taken perennial grasslands and converted them into cropland has augmented the amount of carbon in the atmosphere. That is another very real ecological cost. And of course, if you're spraying an insecticide, what does that impact negatively? There's a group that's notoriously negatively impacted. Good bugs. Good bugs. The good bugs that are our predators on our bad bugs. We're buggering up our entire trophic system. We're also accumulating, bioaccumulating chemicals in maybe levels that we don't want. What about pollinators? Pollinators are under massive threat globally and under decline. And they're responsible for 80% of our global food production. So all of these activity, what about irrigation? Let's pick on irrigation. Is there anyone here for an area that's irrigated? <laughs> Is there any problems that you run into? If you over irrigate, what do you run the risk of? You may drown the plants, but something else comes up from deeper in the soil. And it's a, not just a problem in Western Canada, it's a massive problem globally. India has wrecked millions, tens of millions of hectares of land. Alkali, Alkali salts. So over-irrigation can lead to salinization. These are all real ecological costs. So if you take nothing away from what I'm telling you about, think about this management contrast. And I'm not telling you whether you should be on the right side, the rangeland side, or the cropland side, but understand that this management philosophy spectrum, it exists. It's real. Okay? Okay, so there's all the different costs. Okay, rangeland outputs are way more than forage nowadays. This is the roots of rangeland management, the whole discipline. But it's not just about forage now, it's about biodiversity. It's about thinking about all the wildflowers and how they relate to pollination and all the pollinators out there. It's thinking about species, including wildlife at risk, species at risk. These are burrowing owls. Burrowing owls rely on rangelands. No rangeland, no burrowing owls. 
No, sa uh, no rangeland, no sage grouse in Alberta. There are so many species at risk that are, their survival is heavily dependent on rangelands. Without them, they're gone. And of course, consumptive wildlife, mule deer, antelope, elk, on and on and on. Okay, because of this, we are rethinking and redefining the way we approach rangeland management. We don't think of commodities anymore. How much forage are we producing and how many cattle can we support? We still look at that. That's a metric that's of concern, of course, economically, but we think far more than that. We think now in terms of energy flow. We think in terms of hydrologic function and we, hydrologic function, Amber already laid the, f the, the framework for, for me, because hydrologic function is making sure you absorb water, hold water and make water available for plants that it's not running off or evaporating. It's by preserving the skin, that litter layer on the surface of the soil. So Amber already e explained that to you. And basically comes down to, do plants have lots of light? Do they have lots of water? Do they have lots of nutrients? Do they need, do they have what they need to be productive? And it's looking at things like, how many plants do we have? Do we have the high diversity of plants? Do we have lots of leaf area? Do we have a big root system to bring up that water like Amber was talking about? Same thing with nutrients. We don't want nutrients running off. We don't want them disappearing to groundwater. We want them cycling so that they can contribute to plant productivity, regardless of whether we want to graze cattle on that grass or have waterfowl, ducks nesting in there to maximize their breeding success or whether it's burrowing owls, okay? All rangelands have evolved with disturbance. I think this is really important to think about. It's not that rangelands, we should just stop all, di all disturbance. They evolved with fire. Fire has been around way, way before uh, humans ever got into these systems. In fact, if you look at some of our rangelands, a tall grass prairie burned every two to four years historically. Incredibly high fire frequencies. Now, I'm not telling you go out and start fire and that you're going to be helping these grasslands. That may be the case in some cases, but fire is also socio sociologically a, a, a very high risk, okay, to infrastructure, people's lives, and so on. But the reality is these rangelands evolve with fire and they need fire. Some fire is good. Some places like Texas are way more advanced than we are here in Alberta. They have open advocacy groups that work with and train ranchers on how to use fire and they use it on a regular basis because it is the lowest cost economic control of woody plant encroachment. That's how they manage their woody plants. It's using fire. We haven't gotten to that point yet. The other one is herbivory. All rangelands evolve with herbivory. So if you want to, if you think rangeland conservation, you don't want to put a fence about it, around it and just remove all herbivores. That's not conserving it. That's actually potentially hurting it. You know, we had tens of millions of bison grazing all across North America, pre-European settlement, plus tens of millions of antelope and elk and so on. These bison, what was different is how they grazed, that they would migrate down into the central plains for spring calving, and then they would spend their summer there. Then they would filter back. In the fall and winter, they would move east, north, and west into where the more productive areas were with more cover for the winter and then they would repeat again. Why can't we do this today? Fences. We chopped everything up with roads and fences and we have fragmented the whole landscape. So it's not that grazing can't occur on these areas. It's really a question about how should it occur. That's the question Regardless of whether you're in the field of agriculture or if you're a consumer of agricultural products, you should think about how it was produced. That's what I like to suggest to people. If we have too much grazing, we can degrade a grassland. That's a healthy mixed grass prairie. This is an unhealthy one. This is all a plant called a fringe sage or pa uh, pasture sage. It becomes super abundant in a heavily grazed area because cows don't want to eat it. This is in my area. This is a remnant rough fescue grassland. Rough fescue was our provincial grass, by the way, for Alberta. Very little of that. I, I have scoured the area around my house. I know of about eight different fields, and it's, they're tiny little fields. Everything else has been cultivated, and it's gone. 
Okay? But if you go to southwestern Alberta, you find lots of it. Right across the road, this is a healthy, rough fescue grassland with very little grazing. Right across the road, there isn't a stitch of rough fescue in here. This is the old dandelion, broadleaf plantain, clover, Kentucky bluegrass, because it's heavily, heavily grazed. So the question is, how do we maintain a healthy grassland if we accept the fact that we should have grazing? And by the way, wildlife can, de can degrade too. Because I've heard the argument from some people, oh, wildlife, you know, the wildlife can't really overgraze. Nonsense. They absolutely can. I did my master's in Elk Island in the early 90s. This, this was one of my study areas. This is not a healthy plant community in Elk Island because there's no tall shrubs. There's no regenerating trees. There's supposed to be multiple layers in there for songbirds to nest in and so on. And it's almost all hazel in the understory. That's beaked hazel. So sure, there's something there, it's green, but it lacks the biodiversity, the structural diversity and the plant diversity that it should have because there was too many elk in the park. I called it the little Serengeti of the North. At one point, there was 2,500 elk in Elk Island. In a year-round continuous grazing system, in 196 square kilometers. Anyway, so the key is how we graze. And this actually links really well to what Amber was talking about. It's how we graze that makes it sustainable. Because grazing at a moderate stocking rate and using these pulse followed by rest periods enables us to get the, both, the best of a number of things. For example, the highest biodiversity occurs under moderate grazing. Not under no grazing, we actually get a decline in diversity if you take all grazing out. Your diversity goes down. You can actually get more plant productivity with grazing, something called overcompensation. And you mentioned the saliva. There's even theories out there that saliva contain ammonia, and the ammonia is taken up by plants and helps fertilize. So there's lots of theories on that. Uh, but you can get this overcompensation, the higher biodiversity. You can provide habitat for species at risk. Burrowing owls are an interesting one because they need both heavily grazed and lightly grazed. Guess how we get that? Through patchy grazing. So the continuous grazing that, Amber, you were talking about, it may be not as good for forage production, but it's actually good for burrowing owls because that patchiness is what they need, ironically. But they're not found in your area. They're only found in the mixed grass prairie. And then we can get targeted control of invasive species. I've been doing work since 2001 using cattle to control a noxious weed, Canada thistle, and it works. We use cattle as ecosystem engineers to control weeds. We can do it. Okay, and you can also use cattle grazing to control aspen encroachment. You can see the difference here on this fence line. So cattle can be used strategically not only from an economic perspective to produce something of value for a farm or ranch, but also to improve all kinds of other multiple goods and services. Now, you mentioned mob grazing, you mentioned AMP grazing. We've been working on AMP grazing for upwards of six years, seven years, taking an area like this, subdividing it into little paddocks, and then confining them into one area and then rotating them. That gives you the rest periods that Amber was talking about. This is just a summary slide. These AMP grazed pastures, so the ones grazed like this, more forage production, greater water infiltration. So it means the water that's falling during those big thunderstorm events is getting into the soil rather than running off. We had more surface carbon and enhanced soil methane uptake. And we looked at the microbes, and yes, the microbial profiles are different. I didn't put that on here. Okay? So these systems are very different because of this. I got my one data slide, one real data slide. I'm going to show you. Okay, this is, again, just a reminder, we're, we're looking at lots of ecosystem goods and services now. This carbon greenhouse gas one is huge. Look at the heat wave we had in 2021. Incredible temperatures. Look at the droughts that are occurring globally. We're going to have to deal with this. Whether you believe in climate change or whether it's anthropogenic or not, whether it's human caused or not, if there is climate change. You'd be silly to think that it doesn't exist given what we're going through right now. 
Grasslands are a major storehouse for carbon. So we've done some work. Here's my data slide, my one data slide. Now I'm almost done. We actually compared the impacts of grazing and looking at carbon stocks. And then we did a geospatial analysis across Alberta to quantify whether grazing has actually boosted the amount of carbon. And I'm just going to show this to you because I think it's, in, I think it's very insightful. So we found that long-term grazed communities had 12% higher soil carbon concentration in the topsoil. Okay. But when we geospatial, geospatially linked it to, there's a data set that ABMI has, Alberta Biodiversity Monitoring Institute, basically has mapped the entire province for land use types. We found 3.8 million hectares of grassland contained more than 362 million tons, million tons of carbon. This is a lot of carbon. Okay, think about this, million tons of carbon. And because grazing is such a dominant land use, on almost 100%, not quite, 95% of these lands, we found that grazing had increased carbon stock by 17 million tons. Now you might be thinking, yeah, whatever. Well, what's 17 million tons? Is that a lot? Is it not a lot? Here's what I can tell you. The federal government has told us what carbon is worth. Okay? They've told us, and they're ramping up the value of carbon. Right now, this year, in 2022, it's valued at $50 a ton. This is per CO2 equivalent ton, not of a raw carbon, but CO2 equivalency. When you attach this number, 17 million, to $50 a ton and adjust it for equivalency, the carbon associated with grazing is worth over $3 billion. That's with a B, oops, B, 3 billion. Think about that. The problem is, our ranchers are not getting paid for it yet. They're providing it for free to the public. Anyways, I'll just leave that with you to think about. That's a lot, that's an incredibly important ecosystem service. Doesn't necessarily benefit the rancher directly themselves. Benefits everybody. People in Buenos Aires, people in Paris, people in London that had the heat waves. Remember, they were struggling with heat waves this, this year. People in Vancouver, BC, people everywhere, globally, would benefit. Okay, hopefully I've been able to convince you that we have an incredible scope and diversity of rangelands. They provide way more than livestock forage. Livestock and forage, including biodiversity, carbon, and so on. Uh, modern management balances what we're taking off with what we're leaving in order to maintain all of those ecosystem functions. And sustainable grazing can occur. It's based on having a sustainable stocking rate and adjusting how we graze. That's the important thing. And I suggest you maybe keep that in mind whether you go into agriculture or not, or if you're a consumer of agricultural products. Think about that. Okay. All right. Can we give uh, Dr. Borkley a